Welcome to the YD3 Show. I'm your host, Dave McHugh. Special interview option here for you as we get a chance to look back at the NCAA convention and get kind of a, a sense of what happened from uh, one of those certainly in charge of things. To, in that in a minute. If you ever want to interact with us, though, or have questions for future shows or, or even ideas for future shows, join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash YD3show. You can also join us on Twitter at YD3show or use the hashtag YD3. Uh, the NCAA convention was a first for me and especially us at D3sports.com. It was an opportunity for us to get to see how this all works. And it was one of the, probably the better conventions to maybe make your first, as even those who have been attending these for years would tell you that it was uh, definitely busy and, and full of, of topics to discuss in Division III. Um, certainly, I'll maybe say Division III is at a semi-bit of a crossroad. So we wanted to get an idea of what's going on in Division Three and the recovery, or, or really the, the aftermath, as it were, from the NCA convention in Washington, D.C. Missed out on seeing him there, that we saw each other often. Uh, so we're joining him on Skype. It is Dan Dutcher, the vice president for Division Three. And Dan, thanks so much for joining me, sir. Afternoon, Dave. Thanks for the chance to chat. Absolutely. I appreciate you taking the time. We'll certainly allow people to get an idea of, of things from your point of view. First and foremost, uh, I think the first thing I was surprised by was I knew there would be thousands of people there from all across all three divisions. But I thought Division Three would get swallowed up in a sense that it would be hard to spot Division Three taking part. You forget how big this division is until you're standing at a convention. And I would argue half the people walking past me were Division Three people. Yeah, you know, we have uh, the largest division in terms of members. We also had the most delegates at the convention. I think we we're somewhere north of 1,100, almost 1,200. And um, it, it, the convention is something near and dear to my heart. I love it for many reasons. But probably the number one reason is that it represents uh, it, it, literally the association in action. Um, it's our membership deciding key issues, one institution, one vote. Um, it, it really helps to reinforce the democratic nature of the association and the democratic nature of the division. And uh, in many in many respects, um, to me, it's really what the association is all about. And that's why uh, I enjoy the convention so much. In many ways, it, ironically, that it was in Washington, D.C., it's kind of like the House of Representatives. Um, <laughs> you, you have a vote. One rep, you know, one vote from a, a from a from a delegate or an AD or a president or whatever represents the school, um, and that's how it works. And so, if there is something up for a debate and up for a vote, it's going to come down to that open forum, as it were, in Congress on a vote. Um, how much is that? Maybe something people don't fully appreciate. Well, you know, I, I like to think we're at least a little more functional than uh, than Congress. Probably, but, uh, at least on the Division Three side. <laughs> but I think the analogy is, you know, is, is pretty appropriate. And as a staff member, your responsibility is really to try to ensure that uh, delegates are as informed as they can be about the issues that really matter the most. So, for example, the last few years we've begun to adopt uh, – a format where we discuss various issues on on Friday during our issues forum, and those issues oftentimes will emerge during the subsequent year's convention as potential legislative initiatives. We want to give our membership as much time as possible to think about different concepts, consider different options, give us their feedback, and then uh, let the governance structure take that information and, and, and massage it and, and incorporate it into the policy process. So uh, it's very important. It's fundamental in any kind of uh, democratic uh, association, whether it be uh, you know our, our national government or within the NCAA. It's really important that your membership is as informed as they can be before they make the decisions that, that count. What's interesting is not only is it, certainly the votes take place and there's lots of involvement with that. Uh, you talk about the issues forum, we'll talk about that in a minute, but there's also opportunities for schools to brush up on uh, little things like budgetary stuff or fundraising ideas or um, certainly plenty of other items like uh, making sure everybody is, uh, you know, the right I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and, and the right process has taken place. But what I do find interesting is is this year 
Um, well, Division One gets all the headlines, and it always will get all the headlines. Um, I think I was the only member, technically media member, covering Division Three of all the media members that were there. Division Three, though, was getting the headlines in the case that Division One and Division Two were holding up the ideals of Division Three as ones that they want to embrace themselves, and the biggest one was having their student athletes be part of the voices. Yeah, you know, there were two instances where I thought Division Three really received publicity or, or uh, the spotlight from our colleagues in Division One and Two, and I think it was appropriate. Um, number one was during the opening business session uh, and during President Emmert's fireside chat, where um, <laughs> Division Three was sort of identified uh, as a division uh, that really um, has appropriately continued to try to maintain its uh, integration of athletics into the overall educational enterprise, the unique model that is Division Three, and, and how successful that's been. Um, certainly the other instance, uh, I would say, that clearly received a lot of attention was regarding the concept of giving student athletes uh, voting privileges within the governance structure. Division Three has had two student athletes with full voting privileges on our management council um, since uh, NCAA restructuring was uh, implemented back in uh, the mid 90s. And at this convention, you saw Division One implementing its brand new uh, student athlete um, uh, empowerment in that regard. And then you saw Division Two adopting legislation to give uh, its student athletes uh, uh, a vote on its management council and on the convention floor. Yeah, how important is that, or what kind of message does that drive for those in Division Three? Is this finally that that hint that you know what Division Three is that that model that the NCA truly embraces? Is this Division One and Division Two maybe looking at Division Three with that? You know what, you guys have got a good model that we do need to embrace, especially as Division One goes through this major change with, uh, you know, kind of the big five, as it were, taking us a bit of a sidestep from the NCAA while still being under the umbrella. You know, uh, I would look at it this way, Dave. Intercollegiate athletics is um, in a very challenging time. And I think that's true across the various divisions. And, and some could argue that it, it's even more of a challenging time for Division I, uh, and then by extension, maybe Division Two. I think we're all, uh, we're all face challenges at the institutional conference level. When you're facing challenges, I think folks who succeed the best through rocky waters are the folks who are philosophically grounded, um, who have principles that they uh, can go back to and continue to go back to when they're challenged. That's one of the, I think, the strengths of Division Three. It's a Division Three philosophy statement and positioning platform. And it really emphasizes that our focal point is about the student athlete's educational experience. It's not uh, revenue generation. It's not uh, public entertainment um, so much as it's really about trying to maximize the student athlete experience. And I think we can all learn from our colleagues in the other divisions, uh, vice versa, um, across the board. But this, I think, is one of the, those instances where, given the challenges that um, that we're all facing, recognizing that you can't go wrong when you put the interests of your student athletes first, no matter what the issues are that that you're facing. When you recognize that uh, as a principle, um, you're going to be okay. And I think that was something uh, that, to me, it was uh, sort of a it was encouraging. Uh, and reassuring to see um, our college in D1 and D2 embrace that student-athlete uh, voice uh, concept um, moving forward. Talking with Dan Dutcher here on the YD3 show, special interview here, not necessarily associated with the January show, which will be coming out soon with more con coverage of the National Convention in Washington, D.C., including chats with some of those student uh, advisory, the SAC members who certainly had their opinions about being able to be showcased, as it were, by Division One and Division Two. And Dan, let's talk about the votes first and then back up into the forum, in the issues forum, if you don't mind. Okay. The reason being, first off, most of the votes were in favor. I think we only had a handful that went against um, the idea. I, I don't know if that's status quo or not. Um, some went right through. I, I Actually, there was one. I don't remember what it was. It might have been the letter of intent. I thought for a moment it wasn't even going to get um, motioned, which would have been fascinating. If it hadn't even been motioned or second, it wouldn't have even been voted on. I did get a chuckle out of there. I kind of hesitated at one point going, oh, my gosh, is no one going to even motion this thing? Um, 
But for the most part, everything went through. I'm not going to go through every single one of them with you, but right. Uh, I guess let me start with this. Were there any that jumped out at you that you were either surprised by the vote or at least um, at least jumped out at you as being one of those that you had kind of your finger on that you wanted to see how it would go? Well, I was really interested in, in uh, I would say, probably three proposals or four proposals. The, the one about whether or not we would permit um, an on-campus evaluation for prospective student-athletes. I didn't think that proposal would pass, um, but I was interested to see the extent to which folks might embrace it. As you know, that came out of the uh, work of the recruiting working group, and it was designed as one of, of several suggested ways in which um, coaches could be allowed to spend more time on campus and less time off campus. But ultimately, I think that uh, that was defeated um, for two reasons. One, folks didn't necessarily believe that ultimately it would um, save coaches that much time. Uh, and number two, the student athletes, uh, especially the student athlete advisory committee, um, felt that it might uh, put student athletes in an inappropriate uh, position in that it might make athletics a higher consideration than academics at admissions um, during the recruitment process. And that, that was a concern for them. And I think that was a concern that was shared by, by folks, uh, several folks in our membership. Um, so that was one proposal I thought I, was very interesting. The, the second proposal of note would be the proposal that would have reduced by 10% across the board contest limits in most sports with the notable exemption of football and, and cross country. Um, Ultimately, that proposal was referred back to the governance structure so that we as the governance structure can conduct a comprehensive review of our playing and practice season uh, legislation. Our playing and practice season rules, by and large, are about uh, 10 years old, and this will probably, this will represent our first comprehensive review of our playing and practice season rules. Yeah, we'll talk about contest limits, but we'll also have a chance to talk about contest exemptions, um, a non-traditional segment the overall length of the playing season, um, what we permit and what we don't permit in a broader based, more deliberative way. Um, we'll certainly engage uh, lots of constituents, including SAC, coaches associations, those kinds of folks. Um, we're not on a fast timetable. We hope to come back with models at next year's convention. We wouldn't be voting on anything if we vote on anything at all until the 2017 convention. So I think it's time for a comprehensive review. Um, I think uh, folks are open to new ideas. It doesn't mean we'll end up necessarily changing anything, but it's probably time for, for that kind of, uh, for that kind of discussion. Um, I also felt like the football practice proposal was going to be uh, a very important uh, proposal. Um, I wasn't disappointed by the closeness of the vote. Uh, it, it, it did reflect the fact that it was a controversial issue. Um, ultimately, it seemed that the membership was not quite ready to go forward with a, a, a full, comprehensive um, spring uh, football um, practice model that included contact. But um, that's probably the largest uh, vote in favor of that kind of concept that we've had in a while. And I thought that was significant. So when you think about the proposal I just mentioned, the comprehensive playing and practice season review, Certainly, there'll be a place in that discussion for football, both the regular season and, and what might happen during the non-traditional spring segment. Let's start with football. We'll circle back on some of the others. With football, a lot of the football certainly was the focus of the football side of things. A lot of football coaches spoke up in favor of it. Though, interesting enough, some football schools also spoke up against it. They right. all had different variations of, of the same theme. It was either going to be a stress on resources, especially athletic trainers or those who take care of facilities. It could be a stress on student athletes. The idea that student athletes would have to focus on football instead of maybe doing something else. That was kind of one of those maybe underlying themes I kept hearing. Yep. The other one was certainly injuries. Uh, ask the chief medical officer uh, for the NCAA to step forward and talk about that. I thought he did a pretty good job of just giving the facts and staying down the middle and not giving his opinion necessarily on what was the right or wrong decision. But certainly all of those combined made it for a difficult conversation and especially made it difficult because the coaches are saying, hey, let us teach the right techniques by having this spring practice. But I thought the one thing that maybe was just underneath the surface and maybe is something that people need to think about 
is while coaches were screaming discrimination that these football players are the only ones with non-traditional seasons, I got the feeling and the sensation that non-traditional seasons are going to take a really strong get a really strong look at. And maybe non-traditional seasons for other sports may have their glory days over in this practices and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Practices and, 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 and games study could reveal that as well. I think uh, two items to note along those lines. So uh, the idea that, that, we will benefit from a review of where we're at with the non-traditional season um, as part of this more comprehensive review. I, I would concur with that thought. Uh, keep in mind that we did talk about the non-traditional segment during the forum on Friday. Mm -hmm. um, we were prepared to, to ask a series of questions about possible changes to the non-traditional segment that the delegates might want to uh, identify. But interestingly enough, we never got past the first question, which was, <laughs> do you favor uh, our, uh, potential changes in the non-traditional segment? And a majority of the delegates said, said no, they didn't. Um, so we didn't have a chance to go further and talk about you know, the spring versus the fall non-traditional segment right. in different sports and different uh, combinations of conditioning and strength and, and eliminating the contest, but, but keeping... Um, Keeping the uh, the workouts or um, allowing more uh, player uh, coach time as a as a substitute for the current model, we have all kinds of models that our playing and practice season uh, subcommittee has identified. Uh, we never really get a chance to delve into those in more detail during the forum, um, but I suspect that those may come up for additional discussion as part of this more comprehensive review. What do you say to those in the football who feel they're being discriminated against with not being able to have a non-traditional season? Their point being they're the only fall or spring sport. We won't point out the fact that the winter sports don't have them either, but the fact that they're the only fall or, or spring sport without one. Is it is it more complicated than that? Or is, does it boil down to just simply that? I would say um, it's probably oversimplification to say that they football doesn't have a non-traditional segment because they do. They have a strength and conditioning uh, period right now that permits teams to get together, permits interaction with coaches, um, permits uh, hand shields, um, permits uh, folks to, to use a football. So we're not starting from nothing. Um, we're starting from status quo and talking about possible enhancements. Once you start talking about adding contact, I think that's a really fundamental change. And I'm not arguing against it or for it, but it seemed that the, the recommendation to include contact, um, that really, I think, begins to ask questions about um, proper facilities, uh, proper uh, support, uh, especially from training staff. It begins to add another layer of complication that doesn't exist um, in, the, uh, in the current model. Um, and so that's where I think uh, things um, were f would be fundamentally changed by the model that was proposed. And again, I'm not arguing for or against it. It's very interesting, too, that many uh, coaches were arguing that those who would normally abstain because they don't have football take right. part in the vote. <coughs> I would say it was probably 50-50 on that. Some abstained, some did not. Um, but the vote was very close. It got that, it got up for a re-vote. Um, and that revote was even closer, as some did not abstain. Is this something that is just going to need some time to massage the right way of doing it? Yeah, I, it's something that could benefit from uh, that could benefit from additional discussion. I, mean, to, I want to give the football community a lot of credit in the, in the following sense: um, more or less, they were told uh, rather than coming back every few years with additional minor incremental changes, whether it be, you know, the, um, the, the hand shields or the football or, or the, the tweaks that, that we've seen over the years. Yeah. Um, it was suggested, hey, come back and, and, and give us a comprehensive proposal that shows what you'd really like. And we'll vote it up or we'll vote it down. Um, and I want to give them credit for coming back with, with what I thought was a very responsive model to that charge. Um, it wasn't adopted, but that doesn't mean that the proposal, that, that the concept's necessarily going away. I think that the closeness of the vote um, reflects that fact. And you know, one, one other point, interestingly enough, on reconsideration, I think you hit it exactly on the head. Um, ultimately, on the, the, the second vote that uh, defeated reconsideration, uh, the first vote, I think, was like a 
like a 10 vote margin, but the second vote was like a 12 vote margin or they're very close, yeah. but it, it, it were fewer folks that abstained second time around. And, you know, some of that could have been a function of it was getting late in the morning and, and folks uh, felt like the debate had uh, gone on long enough. So t- timing can be very important um, related to the voting on issues during a business session that may have played a factor. Um, one of the other issues we talked about got voted down was the student athlete, uh, potential student athlete for Division Three, having essentially a tryout, for lack of a better description, basically run through uh, with coaches to test their skills, see what they're like, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by the way, we should mention the football one was the only one that the SAC uh, was for and got voted against. SAC, as you pointed out, was against the idea of this and were and uh, the the majority voted in that favor as well. I point that out because SAC basically was in the majority on all but one vote, uh, which I thought was interesting. They're listening to the student athletes, but on this issue, <clears throat> you told me back in September this one would be tough. Mm-hmm. Getting this one through was going to be difficult. That because this isn't the Division Three model, and we seem to see that because this one wasn't close. Uh, the on-campus evaluation uh, proposal, I think a lot of folks felt that it was just fundamentally inconsistent with the D3 philosophy. Um, I'm sympathetic to the plight of coaches in anything that can help them to basically you know, better uh, allocate their precious time and, and the many responsibilities they have. Um, but I think ultimately a lot of folks felt like it was too far removed from the D3 philosophy to be conducting an evaluation of the athletic abilities of prospective student athletes on campus. Um, And to some folks, not necessary since there are so many uh, club teams and showcases now where um, coaches can can, uh, appreciate uh, the athletic ability of of prospects that it seemed a step in the wrong direction and it seemed like it was unnecessary to to a lot of folks. That that being said, I I really understood the rationale behind the proposal and felt like it was a a brave move for the President's Council to sponsor it simply for a vote. They didn't endorse it, they didn't oppose it, but they said we spent enough time talking about this and this issue is significant enough that we ought to give the membership a vote, especially since about 60-65% of our members last year at the convention in straw vote said they'd like to see it in, in, in legislative form. Um, a lot of other recruitment things went through. For example, instead of waiting till the first day of the senior year for on-site visits, it's now January 1 of the junior year. I thought it was a good argument made that juniors are starting to look at colleges anyway. We might as well let the coaches see them. Uh, now you can also talk to a student athlete once they're done with their sophomore year of high school instead of waiting until they're done with their junior year. Those two seem to go hand in hand. The letter of intent now is in place, though I think there's still some gray area as to how that would necessarily be executed, but that is there in place for people to check out uh, and be able to sign and stuff. It seemed like there were enough, uh, a lot of recruiting things that went through that would benefit coaches, but at the same time, kind of goes lock and step into modern times. I know I was looking at colleges back in the 90s my, in my junior year. It seems like this kind of now kind of catches up to that, that, that style. This isn't a senior-only system anymore. I, I would agree with that 100%. I've got um, two high school seniors at home right now, and I can tell you uh, they, they started looking at schools uh, in their sophomore year. Um, I do think um, folks, there's more information available earlier now, whether it be um, on institutional websites um, and uh, folks taking more visits um, for student athletes, um, the, the club uh, program um, uh, model that has grown to uh, basically as an addition to, if not in some cases to supplant the scholastic model, it just means that uh, uh, the recruiting process is beginning at an earlier and earlier age. It, it, that's not a trend that I'm necessarily in love with. But when you remember the challenge that our institutions have uh, in terms of enrollment management and the role that athletics is playing in that regard, and the fact that at the typical D3 school, at least 20% of the students are student athletes, the idea of trying to get D3 uh, front and center in the minds of prospective students and prospective student athletes um, earlier in that process, 
I think makes a lot of sense because the process is beginning earlier. Um, so you might as well be, uh, you might as well be out there, um, uh, trying to convey, uh, the good information that, that, that D3 represents, uh, earlier as well. The other one that I was interested in, because the conversations made me think that it wouldn't pass was the, con uh, was the one regarding being able to talk to a student athlete on site at a location that might have a multiple day event. So if yep. you're there on Friday and it runs through Sunday, the old rules were, you had to wait until Sunday to talk to that student athlete. You may not even be there. If you're there Friday and they walk up to you, you can't talk to them. Right. When they first were talking about this and they were talking about the amendment, um, it didn't sound good. The amendment was about a 200-vote swing. Uh, it then got to a vote, and it passed easily with only 28 people voting against it. Yeah. That was an interesting moment because it, it literally sounded like there may be people against it, but the vast majority of people were thought that was an, uh, a no-brainer of a decision. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the practical effects of that proposal are, it's just very positive. Um, the idea that uh, for a multi-day event, and so many of these uh, these uh, showcases uh, and tournaments are now multi-day events, the idea that the only time you would be able to touch base with a prospect is after the last contest on the last day um, just doesn't really seem to make a lot of sense. Not only from the coach's standpoint, but from the prospect standpoint too. The original proposal, which would have said, "Hey, any time uh, during that day, as long as you've been released," that struck many, including SAC, by the way, as, as being too permissive. And in, in SAC, this is another proposal. Where I think the SAC viewpoint was very influential. Um, in the SAC viewpoint, one out, which was at the end of each day is fine, but during the particular day may present too many conflicts. Um, we'd rather not have to manage or, or, or deal with uh, as prospective student athletes uh, with with our coaches. Um, but but again, I think this is still a significant uh, step forward in that now you're empowering coaches to be able to contact prospects at the end of that particular day, um, and then they can go on to another event rather than having to wait till the last day of that contest of of, of that showcase. Uh, to, I know I'm taking a good chunk of your time. I appreciate it. Talking to Vice President Dan Dutcher of Division Three for the NCAA. Got a couple more I wanted to hit on before we quickly talk on the forums, if you don't mind. Okay. The first one that, that jumped out at me, too, was the one that uh, that had a very close vote for referral, uh, and that was number uh, that was 14, which was the uh, eligibility of championships. If you've been playing with a student or had played with a student athlete who was ineligible, uh, lively discussion on whether it should be referred, and it just got defeated by referral by a scant 11 points, um, 238 to 227 with eight abstaining. That would have referred it back to be discussed more. So I'm thinking, geez, if it's that close to refer, there's no way this is going yeah. through. Right. And it goes through with flying colors with only 80 against it. This basically yeah. means that technically the championships committee could turn around or the championships committee for that sport could turn around and say, you play with an ineligible student athlete. That That's X amount of games. We've eliminated you from the ability to even co compete. It's nullification. That's an option that they have. Call it the nuclear option for lack of a better description. I found that fascinating and one that seemed to slip through initially until the discussions came up that day. You know, I, my understanding of this nullification principle is that it's actually a little more, a little more user friendly um, than the current process that D3 has been using, which is forfeiture. Uh, and so that uh, for a school that has competed against an institution um, that uh, had been an eligible player, um, that contest is now considered to be null as opposed to the prior uh, approach of, of, of that contest being a forfeit. The records go away. It's like the contest never existed. Sure. Uh, I, I think in, to some extent now this puts institutions that through no fault of their own end up competing against uh, someone who's ineligible. It puts them in a better position. Uh, that's my understanding. It's a concept that's been used successfully in D2 for several years. So it's, it's a con it's a concept that's been tried and, uh, and, and proven to be successful. Um, the, the, the one other piece in the proposal that I think caused a little bit more heartburn than it needed to was the idea that the, minimum fine that currently can be imposed against the school that did have the ineligible player um, has been, under this proposal, is going to be reduced. So yeah, the fine used to go from 500 to $5,000 
Um, this proposal changes to say there, there's really no specific minimum. Um, it's going to be up to the uh, secondary infractions committee to determine what kind of minimum they like. Apparently, 250 is more uh, an example of the kind of fine that they might impose. Yeah, but it's interesting, too, that a school could thus, if let's say they had two games, uh, those games are nullified, they could risk the chance of not even competing in a championship tournament. Granted, timing has everything to do with this. Right. And this isn't something that, you know, in February you also have an ineligible player. It's determined in time. But I just thought that was an interesting twist. Yeah, I think the, the championships committee, uh, and, and I defer to their judgment on, on something like this, feels like this is a more fair way uh, to deal with those unfortunate circumstances and the, the current uh, forfeiture problem. Well, it not only does it put the, the, the game in null, which doesn't hurt the team you played against, but it puts your season in, in a little bit more jeopardy. you got to be a little bit more careful, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. The other one that jumped out at me too, Dan, was that Division Three approved that the NCAA could have a 90th championship. We're going to have to change the Elite 89 award next year to Elite 90. <laughs> right. Um, and women's sand volleyball has been approved. But I found it interesting, and I talked to Sharon Herzberger about this too. We talk about tight financial times. We talk about tight budgets for championships. And granted, no two school in Division Three currently has a women's sand, ball, uh, sand volleyball champion or team of any kind. But the membership voted overwhelmingly to approve it as a sport as well which right. conceivably would put pressure on um, certain colleges if they want to add the sport financially. It's going to add more of a financial burden on the NCAA Division Three level if a championship is born. Granted, this isn't happening next year, I understand. But that was an interesting kind of back and forth. You've got schools in a, in a division that is clearly worried about the money in the future, but adding a sport potentially as a championship. Yeah, I think for the right school, it would pay for itself. Uh, remember, when sure. schools make that decision to add sports, they typically, you know, obviously their, their financial analysis will suggest from an enrollment management side yep. um, that, 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 that the numbers will work. And I think for the right school, sand volleyball could be very successful. Um, there have been other concerns in the past that prevented D3 from embracing the concept. One was um, what it's called and how women are portrayed and, and dressed during the, the event. And that I think we've been able to successfully move uh, beyond that. Um, another concern was the fact that it, it might be the same women playing sand volleyball that are playing indoor volleyball. Yeah. And we've got some pretty good data from the Volleyball uh, Association that, that clarifies that hey, pretty quickly after the, these programs are established, most of your players are, are sand players, not, uh, not yeah. uh, volleyball players. And that, I think, was very helpful in getting the proposals adopted. I think also, yeah, they, they tend to end up being two different sports right? Uh, in, a, in a very big scheme. And it's not like these are large teams necessarily either. You're not bringing in 100 women <laughs> to play and volleyball right. necessarily. Dan, I want to go back to the issues form because you brought up a couple points there uh, okay. before we let you go. One of them was certainly about budgetary issues down the road, certainly yes. other items down the road. What were some of the things that came out? I, had, I popped my head in a few times just to see what was going on. Didn't realize I could have hung out there all morning. Um, <laughs> but did, did you... Yeah. Did, we, could, what, we could have put you at a round table. Dave, you would have enjoyed that. I'm I sure. should have. And trust me, when I'm booking my trip for next year, I'll plan more accordingly. <laughs> but what was it that um, what was it that came out of there that the straw polls revealed and that you guys kind of sensed that the future of Division Three we're going to be looking at in the next year or two as part of legislation or changes coming that 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 just are literally on the surface right now? Well, I don't think we're facing any imminent changes right now when it comes to budget or championships. Our current operating budget projections are uh, that we'll be solid for at least the next three years. We're not projecting any kind of championships deficit until 2019-20. Um, but what we felt we needed to do, uh, we needed to take the opportunity to pose some policy options to our membership uh, in preparation for um, potential budget decisions that will need to be made down the line. Um, what we asked folks was, uh, really, when it comes to championships, um, the series of, of, of uh, budgetary uh, reductions that were made this past year um, have put us in good shape uh, regarding our championships budget. But those, those reductions really ultimately represent 
some greater cross sharing for those schools that do participate in championships. Um, that's one way to approach uh, any kind of championship budget shortfall. The other way to approach a championship budget shortfall is to begin to uh, restrict access. Uh, and especially in our team sports, the one to 6.5 access ratio has been in place now for several years. It actually is in our, our manual. So we take a vote of the membership to change that. Um, but we wanted to get a sense from folks as to did they feel that um, greater cost sharing? Uh, did they feel that the, the current uh, reductions that have been implemented were unduly burdensome? Uh, the majority of the response in the survey was no, they weren't. Um, when we asked them, hey, we you given the choice between additional cost sharing or access reduction, what would you prefer? And they said, yeah, we prefer additional cost sharing over um, uh, access uh, ratio reduction. Um, so both of those uh, both of those comments were consistent with the championship survey that we had conducted this past spring. We also asked them for, on the revenue side uh, if it's possible for us to um, identify and generate additional division specific revenue. Um, would you be interested in going in that direction and targeting that revenue toward championships? And, and folks said, yeah, they would be. Um, when we asked them about the two options that we're that we've uh, identified right now conceptually, and that we don't have a lot of details on these, but one option would be to increase our membership dues, which haven't been increased since 1985. Uh, it's $900 per school and $450 per conference. Um, the other option was, um, would you be interested in some kind of targeted championship surcharge that you'd have to pay in order to be eligible for championships? Uh, folks clearly said, I think it was somewhere around 90%, give or take, that yeah, they'd be interested in a dues increase, um, they would not be interested in some kind of championship-specific uh, surcharge. So that's very helpful information for us. Uh, and then finally, when we ask folks, hey, the current balance between championships and non-championships, you know, 75% allocation to our championships program and 25% to the non-championships program, um, allocating the $28 million budget that we have this year, for example. Um, folks, again, uh, consistent with prior surveys said, we think you have it about right. It's about, about as many people said don't change it as said change it. To me, that, that, that tells me that's probably not an area that's right for any major changes. Uh, we may look at tweaking that if necessary. But I think all of that information together is very helpful uh, for discussions that, that will uh, begin to, uh, to, uh, take, uh, to take part in. Starting with our championships committee, which meets uh, a couple of weeks from now here in Indianapolis, we'll ask them to review the feedback that we received in D.C., maybe look at the, uh, the, the cuts that were implemented this last year and, and see what kind of feedback we get on those cuts. Uh, do we want to look at any tweaks? Take the feedback, share it with our strategic planning and finance committee, and then on to our president's council, management council. This is a budget planning year for us, Dave. Uh, this is the final year of our current budget cycle. So the timing regarding that discussion couldn't have been better for us because we could take that feedback and, and use it to plan our next operating budget. I definitely got a sense that dues coming to be doubled or tripled in the future is not something that schools were against, that they're totally for the idea. I think the big question then comes in, yeah, but we still want to get our, our side of that money. If Division Three is going to boost its own revenues on its own side, they don't want to only get 3.18% of those dues. I think that sounds like it's the biggest hurdle. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't pursue a dues increase if we weren't able to keep the money. Uh, I think that's kind of a non-starter if you're not allowed to keep uh, to keep that, that additional uh, revenue. So... Um, assuming that we can do that, and I don't have any reason to believe at this point that that won't be something that we can work out, but we will have to go to the executive committee with that particular request um, because historically dues have been part of the association-wide uh, funding uh, revenue. So that's something that we'll need to do some additional work on if ultimately we decide to go in that direction. And then my final question, I asked this of Sharon Herzberger as well, outgoing president of the president or chair of the president's council president at Whittier College. Uh, I asked her this per the dues and per the, the amount of attention and, re, and, and let's call it respect of the division three model and knowing that she goes up there and the D2 guy talks about a surplus and he adds championships, uh, adds to the championships and D3 goes up there and says we're dealing with a deficit. Knowing that information, knowing that dues are something that, that D3 wants to make a move forward, is there enough political capital 
maybe to then go to the rest of the NCA and go, can we talk about the 3.18% about maybe increasing it for the division that is the majority of this NCAA? Do you think there's that political capital right now? She said she thought the conversation's going to be at least started now. Um, I I tend to think that the timing isn't right for that conversation, certainly in the short term. I think we need to see how the current restructuring in Division One plays out. Remember now, we're, we're getting a, an allocation of revenue that's generated from Division One. Um, it was uh, an allocation that was guaranteed as part of the restructuring uh, agreements back in the mid-90s. Um, that's not revenue that we generate, but that's revenue that, that we're allocated. Um, I think there are unprecedented revenue challenges potentially that Division One is going to be looking at. Uh, and I'm talking about the entirety of Division One, um, given the implementation of their new governance structure and their new federated model. Um, I would be surprised if folks are amenable to re-engaging in the allocation discussion until some of those issues have sorted themselves out. Uh, there's one other cautionary note that I would I, I would just want to make, and that is, if you open up the 3.18 percent guarantee for discussion, you also have to open up the association wide program and service guarantee for discussion. Keep in mind there are lots of association wide programs and services that we benefit from in Division Three that I think a lot of the Division One membership might say that they would be okay doing away with because those programs and services are already provided. Uh, by the Division One conference office. So when you're talking about scholarship programs, if you're talking about interpretations, um, there are a variety of services that we receive right now that are guaranteed as part of that agreement. If you open that agreement up for reconsideration, then you need to throw everything on the table. Right now, I, I personally believe the 3.18%, it's a really good deal for us. I think we can live within our means. We've, we've uh, developed a significant uh, reserve. Um, that still presents an opportunity for us to, to deal with uh, the financial challenges. So just because we engaged in the discussion with the membership at the convention doesn't mean we're, we're facing any kind of fiscal crisis. Uh, it was really more of us doing our due diligence and trying to fulfill our fiduciary responsibility. Well, of course, made a number of moves on the championship side to cut costs already with more moves potentially coming as well to cut costs down the road. My short conversation ended up being much longer with you, sir. I certainly appreciate it, uh, especially all of your time here. I hope people out there find this information helpful and useful. Um, as always, I give the final word to the guest. Any final thoughts you want to share with those who may have been watching this? Uh, just, I want to thank uh, your, uh, your um, folks that listen to you for uh, their commitment to the division. Um, I'm very bullish about where we're at as a division in, in the future um, that's in store for us. And I think to just uh, reaffirm the point I made earlier, as long as we stay focused on what's best for the student athlete, uh, Division Three will remain uh, strong and true. Very good, sir. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Dan Dutcher, Vice President for Division Three at the NCAA. We certainly appreciate him taking this time on a special edition of the YD3 show, the January edition, coming out with more coverage from the NCAA convention later this month. I'm Dave McHugh. If you want to follow us on Twitter, at YD3 show, or use the hashtag YD3, you can also join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash YD3 show. Thank you, and we'll see you in the January edition coming up soon.